Yes, so it was a question regarding the Athar, regarding Ibn Abbas uh, kissing the hand of Zayd ibn Thabit, and Zayd ibn Thabit kissing his hand. Those are two of the places where it can be found. Uh, and the last reference was regarding the uh, times of tribulation, not to sell arms of the Hadith of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then there's the question regarding not to sell arms to the fighting sides in times of fitna. Uh, this is found in Sahih al Jami' by Imam Jalal al Suyuti. It's also called Al Jami' al Sagheer wa Ziyadah. This is the uncorrupted one, not the <coughs> corrupted one from Dar Salam. The actual Jami' al Sagheer wa Ziyadah, which was uh, printed with the commentary Fayd al Qadir by Imam Abdul Rauf al Manawi and stamped by Imam Muhammad uh, Habibullah al Shanqiti who's the Sheikh of Sheikh uh, Muhammad, Muhammad Abu Shuhba, who was the Sheikh of Sheikh Umar Abdul Rahman, who was the Sheikh of uh, Sheikh Mustafa, Mustafa Kamal, who was, who was one of my teachers. So it's very strong, very, very strong uh, collection of books. Yes, brother. Just two questions. Uh, do you know, like, uh, I heard there was a story of uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he was First question is regarding um, a story in which one of the children of Israel came to Mecca and he had asked about the Prophet Muhammad at the time when he was born. And he asked a series of questions to which he received affirmative answers or answers to his questions that confirmed statements that he had made. And once he heard this, that he fainted, and then when he was revived, he said, it is the case that prophethood has now finally left the children of Israel. What is the authenticity of this story? Alhamdulillah. I do not know the answer to that question. I would have to research that. I don't know about that. That doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means that I don't know about it. So I would have to dig into that and research to, to know about it for surety. Uh, the second question was, was regarding um, the dimensions and discussion regarding the cow. Uh, that was discussed in the last class in the tafsir last week uh, that it was used to touch the body of the one who had died who woke up who then said who had killed him whether the body was exhumed or whether the body had been lying in state and then touched with the articles from the cow Alhamdulillah again I don't know the answer to that question uh, that would require research if there is an answer um, I don't know of any author or any text uh, perhaps uh, there'd be further research that would be needed, but I don't know the answer to that question. So I don't know about those. Yes? Um, when you mentioned the, the rafts of the children of Israel, you, in the fifth one you mentioned that they tampered with the Torah. Mm. But you, did you mention that they tampered with the description of the Prophet in the Torah? Yes. Is that what you that? Yes. Right. So, so it was the description of the Prophet wasallam, and then also the Torah itself as well from the past that had been tampered right. with that they <coughs> Because we, be, we don't believe that the poison came out during the Prophet 
do we believe that she is accountable for his death as well? Okay. As a Jew. Okay. The um the question is regarding Zayd bint al Harith uh, putting the poison in the meat of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we know that the poison did not come out of him. So is she directly culpable for, uh, as a Jew, the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala In one sense, yes, but it must be also remembered that. This woman did become Muslim. As when she was brought to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, she did become Muslim because he asked her, why did you do this? And she mentioned the reason why. And she wound up becoming Muslim when she saw that, uh, that he had not died from the poison and that he had not eaten the poison without being informed that the poison was there. So she did live, she became a Muslim, uh, and uh, she died upon faith. So as far as what had happened, and whether Jews are culpable. Spiritually culpable, yes, because it's demonstrative of the behavior of the children of Israel. So the Prophet Yeshayahu alayhi salam, or Isaiah, being sawed in half, the attempt to kill the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, and other prophets being murdered in great number on one day. <coughs> some narrations mention 70, some narrations mention 120, and other despicable things like this. This is indicative of the children of Israel's, their spiritual state, because they reject uh, the righteous prophets that come to them, um, rather than uh, necessarily being every single Jewish person that's responsible, but their theology lends to prophet killing. We can find of no textual proof of the Arabs or the Pakistani or the Chinese man or the Sri Lankan. Uh, going on a profit killing spree and the reasons for this is that our theology does not lend to this but their theology as we see historically lends to profit killing profit denying and book changing so we uh, we have no other reason but to conclude from that that as we'd understood before Judaism being a false religion uh, it continues to remain as such is there a uh, final question over there, Carter? yes just give some background on uh, Nafisa Tahira. Mm. Um, okay. The question is regarding Nafisa Tahira, uh, more about her biography and who she is. Alhamdulillah. Salaam alaikum alhamdulillah. Sheikha Nafisa Tahira was a contemporary of Imam Shafi'i. Radiallahu anha. She was from that third age. Memory serves me correct. Uh, she is buried in Egypt and numerous karamat are attributed to her in her life and also after her life from dreams that people have seen and what have you. She is among the ranks of the Shafi'i scholars in their biographical notices <coughs> and is considered one of the great female saints. It is a proof of what imams of the Qadiriyah had been saying after and what ulama had said before that in reality the female has no tariqah. The Muslim woman has no tariqah. And the reason being for that is this, the spiritual proclivity of what a tariqah may offer a male is already present in the female. So the general understanding, this is one of the proofs that some of the ulama of the Qadriya use that the female has no tariqah. Because the maqamat and manazil are already present in her. So when you look at the sharia, look at the women coming to the Prophet wasallam. They're asking about what? Fiqh. What happens if I'm menstruating and this happens? What happens? They're asking about fiqh. They're not asking about matters of the spirit, of the soul. They didn't know fiqh. The men are coming when they're asking the Prophet wasallam, like Hamdala and others about what? The, sp the soul, the spirit. Because they know fiqh. They know fiqh. 
And so this is why you will find many a female who is not a faqih or grounded in fiqh, but, but he spiritually knows the ruhaniyat, the matters of the heart and these different <coughs> conditions. And that's why their hearts are layina, they're pliant towards, and you can see it in how the female is towards the children, how they are towards these men. These are all things that come from the layina of how the heart should be and where men are pushing towards. Where men should be headed towards is, oh, your heart should be layina, like this. It should be tender and calm, like this. Right? So she was one of these people, these saintly righteous people, uh, that people would come and visit her and take ilm from her, or they'd ask her questions about matters of ihsan, how to worship Allah as if you see him. And I, I met one righteous uh, uh, female teacher who also uh, was a teacher of hadith. I think I'd mentioned this before. They'd said to me, oh, it's haram to learn from women. Don't go. And in characteristic humility, I ignored those people and I went anyway. And alhamdulillah, I, I got the opportunity to be in the presence of a true worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's one of the things I wondered is I thought, well, wait a minute. She doesn't have any tariqah. These other people she mentioned, they don't have tariqah. Why is that? And then this is where this issue came up. I started researching and I found out that, wait a minute, um, this is the reason why. That <coughs> it's not across the board all the ulama say that, but there's a, a substantial uh, group of ulama that say that in reality the female has no tariqah because a lot of the manazil and maqamat are already in place. They just need to be adjusted regarding the fiqh. Women tend to be deficient in fiqh and men tend to be deficient in ihsan. And if you look in the hadith, you can substantiate that. Alhamdulillah. Yes? So, if there is no final question, inshallah, we will go from there. And we will stop from here. And inshallah, next week we will be starting from ayah 94 of Surah Al-Baqarah, inshallah. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika. Wa shahadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa yatubu ilayk. Innahu ghafur rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa la ilaha illa Allah. Assalamu alaikum.